And I was in positions where I was able to negotiate that arrangement as well as advocate for others and making sure that we were be all being kind of looked at um, or not looked at negatively, right? And looking at it like a positive, right? You have us here prime versus us leaving, right? Right versus zero. Yep. Look at it as you don't have a full time employee, but you have somebody who might not have had otherwise. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the New England Lean podcast. My name is Paul Critchley, president of New England Lean Consulting. I'll be your host. So lots and lots going on here at New England Lean Consulting this week. Um, so I'll get right to it. First, uh, if you haven't already, please check out leancommunicators.com, or you can follow the hashtag Lean Communicators online, either on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And what this is, it's a group of fellow podcasters, and we all have a focus in lean, but we talk about a whole bunch of different topics that I'll say are tangentially associated, whether it be uh, diversity, advocacy, leadership, uh, you know, all that kind of good stuff. It's a really solid group of people um, pumping out a lot of great content. So uh, you can go onto the website. Again, that's leancommunicators.com. You can sign up to get email notifications. So every time one of us posts a new episode of our podcasts, you will get notified. Also, if you could uh, go on to whatever you use for your podcast, whether it be Apple or Spotify or what have you, and if you could rate us and subscribe, that would be awesome. Secondly, if you are listening to this on Monday, the day that we release it, you will also notice on our social media feeds uh, the hashtag root cause racism. Now, I, Paul Critchley, wrote an article uh, for the latest blog series entitled The Colors of Love that's been headed up by my friend Deandra Wardell. Um, again, lots of great stuff, content that um, you know we're going to be talking about. I'm really proud of the article that I wrote. Uh, I worked pretty hard on it, and I'll be honest, it wasn't easy to to write about. You know, when it comes to things about lean, you know, that comes, I won't say it comes easily, uh, but it comes easier for me. But when I talk about how to be an ally, which is what um, the topic of what I wrote w is about, um, I really had to force myself to kind of think different um, about it. And I apply some lean thinking to it, so I think I draw some, some good care. Uh, parallels between the two things. So I hope you are get a chance to read that article. Uh, I'll be sharing it a lot uh, on social media. Uh, we're also going to be having a webinar on Thursday at one o'clock Eastern. Um, so if you search my profile, either on Twitter or on LinkedIn, you'll see uh, registration information there for that. So if you can join us, uh, highly recommend uh, group another group of really solid folks with lots of important things to say, um, and it's an important topic. So again, if you can uh, check that out, i um, anxious to hear where, what you guys think about that one. Uh, which brings me to my guest this week. Uh, her name is Jana Gherkin. Now, Jana is highly qualified, process-oriented engineering and project manager with 25 years of experience in both the defense and aerospace industry. She's been a leader of high-profile, diverse teams, in emerging technologies, uh, she's also had um, uh, responsibility for some established project or products. Rather, uh, she has a strong background in both manufacturing and business process improvements. She's also a champion of diversity and inclusion initiatives throughout the industry, and she's a respected leader of the Society of Women Engineers. And in fact, she was the president of SWE. Um, Jana is a friend of mine personally. Uh, I've known Jana for. 15 years probably, um, she and I worked together literally side by side for a good probably, I think, four or five years um, at an aerospace defense uh, company here in Connecticut. And I don't say this lightly, Jana is one of the smartest people I know. Uh, one of the smartest people I've ever had the privilege of working with, and no kidding, 
I can't think of the number of times when I saw Jonna in action, whether it was in a meeting or handling a, a, a personnel issue, where I wasn't like taken aback, impressed by how she handled it. So I can't honestly say enough good things about, you know, what she does and how she does it. Now, it's interesting too, because Jonna and I are, are similar in a lot of ways. I think, and I, I, I can't attest to this, but I think our birthdays are only a couple of months apart. Um, we both went to engineering schools. She went to RPI. I went to Clarkson. Uh, you couldn't find two schools that are more alike. I mean, we play each other in hockey, you know, three or four times a year. It's a big rivalry. Um, uh, both of us are engineers. We're, uh, again, similar ages. Uh, we both have two kids um, who were born around the same time. So we were going through, I will say, life changing uh, instances together, sort of. Um, so we talked a lot about that when she and I worked together, you know, because we worked together uh, so much that we would often talk about, you know, kind of stuff that was going on at home and do you have this and do you have that. And and I can appreciate how Jonna thinks because she thinks like an engineer, as do I. So it's really relatable. Um, but the reason I reached out to her to come on the show is because this is one of those episodes where I'm doing something a little bit different. Now, we do talk some lean stuff, um, but really... I wanted to bring Jonna on because she talks a lot, both on the episode and elsewhere, about diversity and inclusion and advocacy. So I thought this episode would be poignant to release this week, since we also have the blog post coming out about root cause racism, which is really along the same lines. So I thought the two really melded uh, together well. And John is certainly uh, a heavy advocate for especially women in engineering. And I can say as a as a guy, you know, there's more times than not when I would walk into uh, a conference room where we worked even, and it was mostly guys. Um, and I think that's probably true even to this day. You know, I notice it when we, and I talk about it in the episode, when I go to clients, it's uh, predominantly male. So as much as Jonna and I are alike, I really wanted her to come on and talk about uh, her experiences because those experiences, although shared, are different and she has a different perspective. So that's really why I wanted her to come on and talk about those things and talk about it from her perspective and, and what she's being doing about it and what she continues to do about it because she's such a strong advocate and as a you know I really and I told her in the episode you know I see her online doing things I'll point it out I have two daughters who you know I don't know what life will bring for them they don't know what they want to do you know when they grow up yet but John is one of those people where I'll call them over and say girls come see this is my friend Jonna and and look at what she's doing so she's that good and I was so happy when I reached out to her to ask her to be on the show that that she agreed to be. So thank you again, Jonna. Finally, if you watch these on YouTube, you will notice something different. And maybe not in a good way, because I screwed up. Uh, and I left it there on purpose just to prove that, yes, even though I've been at this for a while, I, I forget, this is episode 20-some-odd. Um, uh, what happened is, you know, normally if you watch this, you'll see myself and the guest on the screen at the same time. It's sort of a split screen. And in this episode with Jonna, it switches back and forth. So who's ever speaking, it has the full screen view. And it it's hard to watch because I just had to do it as I was editing it. So it can it 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 flips back and forth. Um what happened was we had uh, we've had some snow up here in New England lately and we've had some snow days. And when that happens where my daughters dance they'll move the classes to online via Zoom. So when we do that, uh, my daughters will switch it to, I think it's called speaker view. So who's ever speaking, in their, in their case, the uh, dance class teacher will come up full screen, which makes obvious sense uh, because it's not interactive. They're just being taught. So they're muted and they're, they're just watching. And for whatever reason... I didn't even notice it when I was talking to Jonna. I think, honestly, I was so excited just to talk with her again face-to-face because -face, it's been so long. I, I just didn't even notice it. And, in fact, you'll see next week um, our guest. I didn't notice it then either because, I obviously, I pre-recorded these, so I did that interview shortly after I did this one with Jonna. 
Um, and I noticed it halfway through, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, what is going on here? Um, so you'll notice that next week, too. So I fixed it uh, for future. So I added it to my standard work. But just I left it in because it just goes to show you that, you know, we all make mistakes. I'm not perfect, as as really none of us are. Um, so forgive me if it, uh, if it messes you up a little bit to watch. But as always, um, I hope you enjoy this episode, and I hope you get something out of it. Have a great week, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, welcome to the New England Lean Podcast. As I mentioned in the intro this week, we're honored to have my good friend and former co-worker, Jonna Gherkin. Jonna, hello. How are you? Hey, Paul. It's so good to see you. It's been so long. I know. It's like a decade. How crazy is that? That, that is pretty crazy and scary to right. think <laughs> I know, because I think we both had our youngest kids back yeah. during those times. And before we jumped on, we were chatting. They're what, 13 and 12 now? Mine are, mine are 13 and six, uh, 13 and 15. R right, but our youngest. So my youngest. Oh, the youngest. 12. Oh, gosh, you're right. 13, 12. Yeah. So right about the same age. Yep. Yep. So because I remember because I, I remember working there, taking the two week uh, FMLA, you know, time off. So, yeah. So things are good. How's life? Yeah, life is good. Life is busy, crazy between work and our extra, the so-called extracurriculars that we all have. Uh, my personal, you know, things that I've been doing as well as my kids and driving and sports and activities and uh, there's just plenty, plenty to keep us busy. I've actually been a little uh, happy with the whole pandemic kind of slowing us down. Um, it's been nice to have a little less less pressure and less scheduled craziness. Yeah, I'm honestly, I'm right there with you. Danielle yeah. and, and I talk about just that, you know, in I'll say May, June, you know, here in Connecticut, which you're in Connecticut too. So, yep. you know, the, the weather changes and it's starting to get warmer. And at that time, it was still early enough in the pandemic where a lot of things were still up in the air. So I, we really noticed here in our neighborhood, you know, as people out walking their dogs, it's, you know, um, yeah. four, four thirty. everybody's home and just kind of, and I'm like, you know what, this is kind of better in a way. And again, I don't want to, you know, COVID-19 obviously sucks, but, you know, but from a, you know, to your point, you know, it was, it was kind of nice that things just kind of slowed down a little bit. We had a lot less to, you know, all, fewer balls to keep in the air. Yeah, absolutely. We spent a lot more time outside, you know, saw the neighbors a lot more than we normally probably would. I totally agree. Right, right. So, John, so obviously you and I know each other pretty well. I mean, we worked shoulder to shoulder every day for five years or so. But uh, for those who maybe don't know you, could you just hum a few bars? Like, how did you wind up where you are now and doing what you're doing? Ah, thank goodness. So... Let's see, the long is a short version. <laughs> short version is uh, I've always had a passion for um, for making things better, for improving pro improving things. I'll say I don't think I knew the word process early on, but making things better, right? Making things work faster, making things work more efficiently. That's always been something I love to do, and um, the engineering world has really kind of helped me um, fulfill that. To, to understand what that means, how do that how does that really turn into a job? Um, and so you know it's been oh, like 20 I've been out of school probably 25 years now and I've used the opportunity every opportunity to grow and to learn and to become a better engineer, but also to become a better leader, to become a better colleague, to become a better um, contributing member of society through all the different organizations that I volunteer with. So um, it, it's, it's been a long road. It's been, you know, I'm certainly nowhere near done, but um, you know, I, I feel like I've accomplished a lot in the last, you know, 20 odd years. Um, and I find, I find it very fulfilling um, that I, that I'm here now in a, you know, in a job that I like a lot and in a, with a family that's, you know, healthy and happy and um, be, with the time and the resources to do a lot of other things um, that we like to do, whether it's volunteering or traveling or sports and things like that. 
Nice. Nice. And we should, so you are, you are an engineer, right? At, yes. Right. So that's how you put together. That's me too. Um, and we worked at a very large aerospace manufacturer here and you still do. So I left, yep. you know, a long time ago and you're still there. So, um, that's so, so we obviously, you know, worked on some pretty cool stuff and you st obviously, you know, still do. Um, but we can't necessarily talk about those things cause it's, you know, national security and all that fun <laughs> and stuff. Oh, I well, it kind of is. Well, some it of, of it is. is, some of it not. Yeah. Although I don't know if, I mean, I forget. I think I get listened to in 30 some odd countries now. So I don't know if any of them li are listening in to see if they can get any, <laughs> you know, Department of Defense secrets off the New England podcast. It's highly doubtful, but nonetheless, I really won't what I, yeah. So really, I guess, you know, one of the reasons uh, I reach out to you just, you know, aside from just wanting to see you again, because we haven't, right, we haven't seen each other except online and, you know, a while, um, is the extracurricular stuff that you kind of talked about. Because, you know, if I think of anybody I know in this industry, in this region, I, I can't honestly think of anybody that does more than you do, quite frankly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I wanted you to, so obviously you were in the jacket and your virtual background is sweet. So I, you know, I know you've been heavily involved with them for a long, long time. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. And I know you've got, you know, uh, you've been on podcast talking about that and you've done even, com I, didn't you commence speak at Quinnipiac University, was it? Yeah, the School of Engineering, Quinnipiac School of Engineering um, in 2018. Nice. In speech. So I just was it's curious on, if you could just- Just a little line, still yeah, available. <laughs> right. So I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about that and and you know maybe what it's been like for you and your career path and you know chat maybe some challenges you face and then funny stories that you can share you know anything like that just to kind of mm -hmm. paint paint a little bit of a picture for us right well so SWE Society of Women Engineers is actually one of my passions uh if you couldn't tell from the uh and I actually didn't put on my pins. I've got a whole bunch of pins I couldn't decide which one to wear so I didn't put any of them on um and it's been a passion of mine since college. Uh, it was my lifesaver back in college when uh, I went to an engineering school. So I went to RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York, which um, at the time was primarily an engineering school. There really weren't that many other majors. There have since uh, added several, but um, I'm here at the School of All Engineers and at the time, and unfortunately still mostly men. Um, at the time I went, I believe there was about, it was about four to one, I'm not exactly sure what it is now, but having SWE there, the Society of Women Engineers section there was really my, my sorority, I like to call it. Um, I, we actually, we had sororities, I chose not to join one, but you know, SWE was that for me. It was my network, it were my friends, it was my support system. It's how I actually made it through to graduation. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, many women do not finish engineering degrees. They start and they drop out for various reasons. Some of it justified, you know, financial or family or other reasons, but some of it is just because of pressures and um, expectations that are, that are unrealistic and other um, biases that really are not really justified. So, Early on, I knew that I was gonna need that support system in order to be successful. And it, it was, it was amazing. Um, and I have friends still now from those days. Um, I have friends in my SWE network from my first day here in Connecticut that I met as when I moved here from, that, from out of state. I'm still friends with them now, right? It has been kind of my um, constant throughout, throughout my career. Uh, I started in the, the collegiate section, just helping out, right? Doing the things you do when you're in college, you know, putting on events. And, you know, we did this amazing weekend uh, that I helped organize, or I should say, I didn't originate. It was already organized and I helped. This was one of my first little improvement areas. Uh, I figured out how to, right, do the, what we've now called this kind of the standard work or standard operating procedure. I created that for our weekend where we brought in the accepted female students. So once all the acceptances went out in the spring, we'd invite them to campus for an overnight um, to give them an idea of what the campus is like. And we were specifically obviously targeting the females because we knew 
that they might be the most uncomfortable coming to the campus, knowing the, um, the ratio of men to women. So we had them come for the night. Their parents did some parent stuff, right? Learning about financial aid and mm -hmm. all that stuff. We organized them uh, bunking with a uh, student, right? They got to sleep over in a dorm. They got to go to classes. They got to see the dining hall. They got to do activities. Right, um, you know, so it really gave them that experience. And that, you know, was like my big contribution, right? Leaving a binder of instructions on how to do everything, how to make sure you had all the approvals and the, um, you know, schedule and how to match, right? How to match a student with the, uh, you know, the, the collegiate, right? It was important. We were trying to match students with, you know, within major, right? A mechanical engineer with a mechanical engineer or, a, you know, a civil engineer with a civil engineer, really trying to convince them it was the right place to go to school. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, my college career. And so as soon as I moved to Connecticut for my first job, um, which was in a defense contract, a defense industry uh, company, I immediately reached out to the Swiss section because I knew I needed them. And they helped with, figuring out where should I live? Like, I don't know this state at all. Mm. I don't know where I'm going. Where should I live? I'm gonna be working at this company. You know, what's the right area? Where are the great cool places to eat and hang out? And what do I need to know? Um, you know, so it was very helpful uh, that, that way. And so that section, you know, I, again, I became involved helping with events, um, you know, mixers and socials and learning opportunities, right? Any way to kind of make those connections, uh, not only, for my own benefit, right, to grow myself, but also to help others who might eventually be in that situation in the future. So um, this is probably a, a good fun, first funny story. Um, one of the things that we do in SWE, or we used to, is we would have these conferences in the spring where um, it would be a collection of sections, you know, in your area. They, they were called region, region conferences. But they're now called something different. And um, at one of the first ones I went to, right, a couple of years, I was like, this will be great. We'll meet other women from New England, right? Try to share best practices amongst the sections. Um, and then there was a meeting which talked about the different opportunities at the, the bigger SWE, the bigger society level. And they were talking about um, all these different kind of positions where we'd have to send a representative from our area, from our region. And they listed a whole bunch of them. And I'm like half listening because I'm not really, <laughs> I don't really know what's going on. And then they're like, well, and then we have this one position for membership, um, you know, looking at our membership, figuring out how to retain people, right? How to bring new members in, how to retain them, things like that. And they explained it. And I'm like, oh, it's like data analysis. And it's, you know, looking for patterns and, you know, a lot of the things I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Little did I know that I had just committed myself to, to a position on a society level committee ah. for several years. <laughs> Oops. So that was my kind of first foray into, right, into things beyond our little local uh, area there. Um, and I hadn't yet really even done that much in the local section. I mean, I, I think I might have been secretary of the section at the time, which I actually held for about 10 years, but um, that wasn't that challenging. There wasn't a lot to do at the time, but this first foray into that level of um, the society was, was kind of an eye opener. Cause I was, you know, I knew there was this big organization around us. I knew that there was something going on, helping keep us all going, but I had no idea how much there was going on. Hmm. And that was kind of that first, eye opener when I was like, wow, there's a lot going on here. And I got hooked pretty quickly. So a couple of years on that committee um, gave me that kind of kick to, to keep moving. And the chair of the committee, um, when I was, I was actually asked to be chair elect. And so my chair at the time, we're sitting, and I remember this so vividly, sitting in the hallway of a, a conference center, because we were at one of the um, annual conferences, we're sitting down having this kind of little one-on-one -on -one, and she's like, have you ever thought that maybe one day you want to be sweet president? And I looked at her like she was nuts. <laughs> thought had no. never got across your mind. No, never. 
never, never even like crossed my mind. Like I was just, I was still down here and she was way up here. Um, and I, I literally, I'm like, uh, no, not, not even on my radar. Like not even think about it. She didn't push it. You know, it kind of dropped it. But I actually told this story at my installation as sweet president <laughs> years later, because I think in the back of my mind, it kind of planted a seed, mm. you know, that she thought I could do it, that she thought I was, you know, capable, um, having only really, you know, served with me a few years on this committee. Uh, and it was, you know, one of those, I, I think one of those reasons that um, I, I went ahead and kind of went down that path. So you know, several positions later, right? Lots of different opportunities within the society to kind of move my way around and up. And um, I served two terms on the board of directors as the um, director of membership of all things, because I had the background. Right, because yeah, you'd raise your hand, right? So, right, because I raised my hand not knowing yeah. what I'm getting so, in. So yeah, I, I'll do that. Yeah, that's that sounds fun. Yeah, why not? So, um, so yeah, so I was honored to be the um, FY18 president of uh, the society um, from um, June, July of 2017 to June of 2018. And it was um, an amazing experience. Uh, so um, fulfilling, uh, you know, there's, it's one of those things you just, you have to think about. There's so many words that you can use, right? Inspiring, fulfilling, um, you know, a grateful, um, you know, honored is one of those things. And I do remember when um, talking about it with the family, because I knew it would have to be something I couldn't just do without everyone on board, right? Because right? yeah. it takes a lot of time and effort, because I'm still working, by the way, right? These are, this is a role that's a volunteer role that you right. do while you're still working. Right. And thank you for, for mentioning that, because yes. I don't know if everybody realizes that. So you, now you're SWE president and you work full time. And you've got, right, a husband and a house and two boys. And, yep. you know, I know you're, are you, and at the time, I think you still might be involved with Girl Scouts of America. Well, also. that actually started after. That was a result of SWE. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. But it's, yeah. So like I said, it, you know, in the beginning, like, I don't know anybody that does as much as stuff as you do. <laughs> right. Well, what's interesting. And so I guess I should, I didn't actually mention this and I should bring it up to your listeners. So, um, I was in a unique, a little bit of a unique position um, versus some of the other presidents where I actually was working part-time at the time. Uh, I had decided after the birth of my children not to go back full-time. And so I had been working for several years on a part-time basis. And, you know, it was 30 hours a week, so it's not totally part-time. And 30 is sometimes 32 or 34 or 36, right? So yeah. loosely 30. <laughs> and actually... I think I forgot. I obviously forgot that, but I think I, yeah. Cause I think I remember now that you mentioned it when I was there, I think I remember that you had gone part-time. Probably right. right. Right after I left, went into, uh, yeah, I had already been moved out of manufacturing. I was in engineering. Uh, I had my first son and yeah, it was one of those things. I was like, let me try this. And I didn't have, um, any reason not to go back full time necessarily? Well, it wasn't planned. I was like, let me just try this, hmm. see how it works. Um, and it actually worked really well for so many, for enough years. That I was like, oh, let me keep there. And I um, and I was in positions where I was able to negotiate that arrangement as well as advocate for others and making sure that we were be all being kind of looked at. Um, or not looked at negatively, right? It, looking at it like a positive, right? You have us here prime versus us leaving, right? Right Versus zero. Yep. Don't look at it as you don't have a full-time employee, but you have somebody who might not have had otherwise. Right, right. And actually, so was, sorry, go ahead. And that was, no, no, I was gonna say, well, that's where kind of the whole SWE thing comes in, right? Part of SWE is advocate, advocacy, right? Advocating for yourself is one of the important points that we try to, you know, teach folks. And so that's, it was nice to have that, learning kind of go from one to the other, right? Mm -hmm. From the work or from work to sweet, kind of having things go both ways. Right. And, and so my, actually my wife, Danielle, uh, did the same thing. She went part-time after our youngest was born and gosh, I think she stayed part-time for, 
uh, my memory fails me because it's been a while, but I think it was six or seven years. Is that kind of what you did too? Uh, yeah, well, 15. I just went back full time in December. Oh, wow. So, so 15 there you years. go. So, yeah, yeah. 15. So, yeah. so, how can you, uh, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot too, too bad, mm-hmm. but how was, how, you know, cause uh, all right, so I'm a, I'm a dude, I'm a guy. I don't have the, I don't have that perspective. Right. And it is different. Cause you're right. When I can remember, I mean, I've, I've been, I've always been a mechanical engineer and I've always been in, uh, in manufacturing. So even today as a consultant, when I go to places, you know, a lot of our clients are in manufacturing with some in healthcare, but I'll say, you know, in the healthcare, it seems to be more diverse, but in, in, especially here, you know, Hereford to Springfield and Aerospace Alley, you know, I go to a tier one or a tier two aerospace uh, supplier. It's, it's a bunch of dudes, right. Running mills and lays. So, so for, for you, can you talk a little bit about what that was like to uh, what it felt like to, to go and ask, you know, did you ask permission to say, Hey, I really, I'm thinking about doing this. I want to go part-time and, you know, I'm trying to balance everything and, uh, what was that? What did that feel like? And, and did you get any pushback ever? And, or was it, you know, uh, kind of celebrated and supported? So I'm not sure if it was asking permission as much as laying out the plan and saying, this is what I'm going to do. Are you okay? Does it make sense? Hmm. So it was, it was more like, here's what I'm going to do. You know, pretty much, unless you tell me otherwise, <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> but the, the really the important part was figuring out how to scope a role that would make that would be value to the company while I'm part time. So um, I did plan ahead a little bit. I mean, I when I knew I was you know getting ready to leave on maternity leave, I did kind of plant those seeds early, saying I'm not sure if I'm going to come back full time. So let's think about what the options are. Um, so it wasn't a surprise, right? I didn't want to you know call my supervisor and say, hey, guess what? Hmm. Yeah, not coming back or, you know, I'm only coming back part-time and, you know, not full-time. So I, I kind of tried to leave the options open. So as we were planning for me to return, um, I actually used, and you mentioned early FMLA, I used some FMLA to start to try, not only to try it out, but to give time to figure out what we were going to do. Um, I also conveniently, purposely, planned to come back to different roles ah. completely. So I wasn't coming back to something that existed. So this is probably, this is a little off the tangent, but some good advice from folks. Working yourself out of a job is not a bad thing. So most of those roles, I worked either worked myself out of the job or I trained my replacement before I left. So I could come back to something different. So it was a lot of, you know, back and forth for a little bit, for a couple of weeks while, you know, using the FMLA until we kind of fleshed it out enough that I could, you know, make the commitment to go permanent, you know, to go the permanently part-time because it is, it's a commitment. And I'd say everything was great until I wanted to get promoted Hmm. and I wanted to be a supervisor. And so that's when the pushback started. We can't have a supervisor who's part-time. We can't have a supervisor who's not, right? You know, all those different excuses. And my real response to a lot of that was why not? Just because you hadn't done it before doesn't mean it can't be done. Right. I mean, I'll tie it back to lean just for a little, a little bit. I mean, that's a, you know, one of the biggest questions we ask clients is why do you do it that way? And uh, seven, eight times, you know, out of 10, the answer is, well, that's the way we've always done it. We've always done it. Right. So, okay, well, let's try something different. I mean, that's whole P that's PDCA. I mean, that's, let's just try something different. So why not have a, because to your point, it's like, do you want John Gherkin here 32 hours a week or, or zero? I mean, I'll take 32 exactly. every time, right? So let's figure it out so it works for everybody. Yep. Yep. That's exactly. So that's exactly it. And I, I did come to find out later, kind of in retrospect, that it had been done before, but very sporadically throughout the company. And so unless someone in the organization knew that, right, there was not a lot of cross- you know, cross talk on, on, on who had done it. Right. So there was no database that said, Oh, here's all the people who had done it before. Gotcha. Right. And it wasn't a really good way to search. So, you know, my organization, it had never happened. So in their minds, they're like, we've never done it. Hmm. 
So, you know, it took a while. I pushed, I pushed, I kept asking. Um, I kept every excuse or every reason, I don't want to say excuse, but every reason they gave, I had, I had a response. Mm -hmm. Either why or here's how I would handle it. Mm -hmm. Here's how this would happen. Here's how we would do this. And, um, you know, after a while, they relented. I don't know if that's the right word, but <laughs> they were able to, they had an opening. Let's say, we, you know, with the way the organization had evolved, they had an opening that actually worked very well. Um, for me, the key to it was um, it were, they were experienced engineers who didn't really need a lot of day-to-day -day guidance, who were, you know, contributors on their, you know, experts in their own right and contributors were, you know, yes, they needed a supervisor, right? They needed an administrative supervisor. And then they really needed someone to help with their career guidance and, you know, development, but they didn't need somebody who was going to be there every day looking at their work, you know, asking about their progress, right? They didn't need that kind of oversight. Right. And that worked really well for me in part-time and not there every day. <clears throat> so, yeah, so that we, we kind of worked out the boundaries, right? Ground rules, how, how, how to get in touch with me if I'm not in the office, you know, when it's okay to call at nights and weekends. And, you know, we had everything laid out and everyone was like, uh, yeah, I'm fine. I don't want somebody over my shoulder every day. And I want to have those career discussions. And that's really what I enjoyed most about it. Nice. Nice. So do you feel, so let me ask you this. And again, I, this is just a perspective that aside from my wife, you know, and a few other close female friends, I don't know if, you know, like I don't get a lot of necessarily, cause I don't have a lot of these types of conversations and I don't know if as an industry or I don't know, as a society, if we have enough, maybe enough of those. So um, as you were going through that, did you, What's, how do I want to ask this? Did you feel like your employer was trying to help you find a solution? Or was it more like, were they trying to find reasons why it might not work? Or was it somewhere down the middle? Or was it just like, was it you know, like, hmm. um, like just uncommon, not uncommon, but, but shaky ground? Like they just weren't quite sure because, you know, again, in their heads, it had never been done before. So they weren't quite right. sure how to handle it. Yeah, I think it was more of that. I mean, I don't think there was any like um, pushback from, a, you know, this is a terrible idea or, you know, we're not, you know, we don't want to set a precedent. Right? I don't think it was from that negative side. I think it was more the uncomfortable. We're not sure. We it could, and I, I'd have to, you know, in retrospect, maybe it was, we want to make sure you're successful and we don't want to put you in a position that you can, that you'll fail. Mm. That could have been it too. Um, you know, certainly I had the support of the managers and all, and, you know, the, the management team. So, you know, it could have been a little of that, right? Let's make sure we can find something that you're not going to be struggling with or feel or, or end up leaving because it's not working. Yeah. Good point. That's valid. That's so I'm glad that it, you, at least part of that was, you know, made you know, been. helped you feel that way because that's the, like the worst. Um, cause I've had positions where, yeah. you know, which may or may not have been at that employer hint, hint, is where I, you know, eventually found myself in a position that I probably shouldn't have been in, you know, I mean, there were certainly aspects of it that I loved, which, you know, I do miss, but, and then there's just other pieces where it's like, you know, if I'd had a supervisor who knew me better, they, they would have said, yeah, this is not going to be a good role for you because all right. the, all of this stuff, you know, the, the, the administrative and the political stuff, like that's really like gets right on your last nerve. So, so it's good that there's some, at least some semblance of, you know, let's not set you up to fail. Right. Cause that doesn't, that at the end of the day, that helps nobody. Right. Right. Nice. So you were president of SWE. Yep. And then that yeah, term was over in 2018. Yep. And then, so how did the Girl Scouts of America thing happen? <laughs> You're out selling cookies or something. No, and no, yeah. <laughs> no, well, actually, so I had never, I was never a Girl Scout. So, uh, I mean, I knew obviously about Girl Scouts, the cookies and all the other great things um, that the organization does, but I just, you know, it was just not in, you know, in my childhood, but actually, so the CEO of the, of the Girl Scouts of Connecticut at the time reached out to me because of my SUI presidency um, and had invited me to an event 
that we have every year called uh, the Breakfast Badge event, where we honor three or so, three, I think it's three women every year um, based on a theme, various different leadership type themes. And uh, she invited me as a guest to the event um, as we president, had me at the one of the head tables with one of the award winners and one of the girl members that was being honored. And so Girl Scouts, right, is driven by the girls. And so every, we also not only honor the adult women, but we honor girl members. And this girl had, if I remember correctly, sold the most boxes in the state. Oh, wow. And I don't quote the number, but it was like an astronomically high number. Yeah. And I was just so impressed with her. Um, you know, how, why she, how she did it, what motivated her, what she's going to, what they're going to use the money for, right? What the troops going to use money. It was amazing. The stories were amazing. And I was just like, ah, this was, it was so great. And, and I knew Girl Scouts was great, but this, you know, was a really great event. And so, you know, I go to this event, no problem, you know, enjoy it, meet, meet a bunch of people. And, you know, a couple of months later, I get a call. I'm actually at a SWE event a couple of months later and I get a call from the, um, their, um, the board development committee who places board members and says, we would like to interview you for, would you be interested in a potential, potential board position? So, you know, I, I asked a lot of questions. Um, having this come, just come from the SWE experience, I kind of knew what questions to ask about a nonprofit mm -hmm. and, you know, how it's organized and what are the challenges and strategy. And so, uh, you know, I got a lot of questions answered and I certainly had to answer a bunch myself. And uh, by the end of the year, I think it was, I was on the board. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still, are you still there? So I am, I am. I'm still on the board. I'm actually the chair of the audit committee ah. and um, which also oversees the risk management plan. So that's kind of where my, the strategy and all the learnings I have from SWE and, and actually from work as well, kind of go into what makes a good risk management plan, right? How do you identify risks? What are the right kind of mitigation activities? When should we care? When does the risk become risky enough to do anything about it? And when is it just something we have to monitor? So um, we've been working on that the last year or two and it's evolved and we're making changes, process improvement always, mm -hmm. trying to make it better. Um, staff does a lot of the work on it and we have an amazing staff. So we wanna make sure that we're not adding undue burden to their work. We wanna make sure everything's tied together and is easy for them to connect the dots between the strategy and the operational plan and you know all the different um, initiatives and metrics we have. So, so it's been great, a uh, great opportunity. Um, we actually just uh, appointed the new, a new CEO to the organization. And I was on the search committee for that, which was uh, a really cool experience. That's cool. Yeah. To find a new CEO for, for an organization. Um, and we're thrilled that our, the, thrilled that the, the new CEO comes from, I'll say sort of from within. She's been a Girl Scout all her life. Oh, Cool. And, uh, but she's, you know, she's a successful um, engineer. She happens to be an engineer, which is great. So known her for a while. Yes, go engineers. So I've known her for a while through that. And she just retired as a, uh, as an executive at a, um, you know, at, at a big corporation. And this is her, you know, dream job, she told us, her dream wow. career. So nice. We're excited to that. That's cool. So, and that's, so I'll tell you, John, I mean, uh, I talk, I've talked about it on the show before a little bit and I've blogged about it. So, um, uh, Emma is our older one. She has very strong engineer tendencies. I don't know if she's going to wind up being an engineer in, in real life when she grows up, she doesn't know yet what she wants to be, but yeah. you know, you, you know, it's like uh, that old Dilbert cartoon where they have the knack. You've probably yeah. seen that, right? Yeah. So she, she, she's got it. Like when she was little, um, she was at daycare with, and my mother-in-law was uh, watching her at the time. This is, uh, uh, Danielle had gone back to work. And um, so anyways, they had this like little play tent and she's, I don't know, three or four. And there's this little play tent thing and, and it kept tipping over. Cause I think the kids were inside, like, you know, they're treating it like a bouncy house. Yeah. Well, my mother-in-law tells a story of how she goes and gets these like little blocks. They're just like little cardboard boxes. And she goes and gets four and she puts one in each corner to like weight the thing down. And I'm like, how, how, where did, how did you get this <laughs> idea? Why? Like, so that was, you know, whatever, yeah. 11, 12 years ago. And, and 
there's a thousand examples since then. So, but I'll, I show her a lot of your posts on LinkedIn. And I'll be like, I worked with John, like, look at, this is what you can do. And she's gone to spark at UConn uh, in the summer, to, you know, STEM stuff. So um, I'll just say as a, you know, again, as you know, as a, as a, as a male engineer, I ha I'd like to think I have a more of a perspective on it now, especially having daughters. Um, you know, I, I didn't always recognize the fact that, you know, in conference room and stuff, 20 some odd years ago, there was, you know, a bunch of dudes and you, or, or somebody like yeah. you, you know, and, and as I was preparing to have you on the show, I, you know, I kind of was thinking back of stuff that you and I worked on together. And I'm like, I was trying to think if there were any other women in the room. And I, I honestly had to, I honestly think a lot of times the answer was no. Yeah. So I, yeah. I just, it's like, wow. Cause I went to Clarkson and we had the same, the same, um, male to female ratio. It yeah. was like five to one, four to one right in there. And I think, you know, we're roughly the same age and it's just like, wow. And I, I like to think that as a society, we've come a lot farther, um, to focus on things like that. And I, and I honestly, I'm not blowing sunshine on you. I think it's because of work like, that people like you do to push. So well, I'll just say push so hard and advocate so hard because, you know, I, there's stuff that I, you know, maybe sometimes I take for granted and I don't even realize it, you know, until I see something that you post or an instance that, you know, Danielle has at work and she's not a manager um, mm -hmm. or that, that, you know, one of the girls, my daughters have at school, you know, just some comment that somebody makes some other kid makes. And it's like, you know, so, yeah. you know, so thank you, I guess you is know, all I'm trying so, to say. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. Like, so children are naturally curious. They're natural inventors. They're natural engineers, right? If you put a bunch of toddlers in a room together, male and female, right, they're going to create, they're going to play, they're going to, you know, imagine. It's there. It's in, it's in all of them. It's what happens afterwards that changes, hmm. right? It's the peer pressure. It's the you know, biases that people do and don't know they have. It's the environment, it's culture, it's, there's so many things that, uh, I don't want to say not hold women back, but, you know, make them consider other careers from engineering. And, you know, despite years and years and years of challenging that, it's very hard to move that needle. It's been very hard to make substantive changes in the, in the numbers. Um, as much as we feel like we're making progress, the numbers aren't yet bearing out that change because it's such a big hurdle. It's, it's been such a challenge and the headwind, right? There's always new, you know, people are being born every day. It's, mm. you know, it's hard to keep up. It's hard to get ahead. So, uh, you know, I appreciate that, that, you, that sentiment and that you're feeling that way. And absolutely, we've made great strides, but there's just so much more to do. And the more actually folks we can, uh, educate about it. Folks like, you know, folks like you, folks that are not engineers, um, you know, folks that may be uncomfortable even defining what an engineer does, right? The more we can get those, uh, that education out there, the better, because we need more folk, people advocating on behalf of engineering and women in engineering and minorities in engineering. Regardless, you don't have to be in that demographic, right? Having men as allies is a, a, actually a really big opportunity for um, for not only our organization, but you know, for many organizations, because right now that's the dominant cult, the dominant um, culture, right, in companies, right? It's male. Mm -hmm. So unless we can get men as allies, we're not going to be able to make much change as quickly as we need to. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm at a loss for words, which rarely <laughs> happens. I mean, especially as a podcast host, so I'm getting an F. Good for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, see, I get the edit key, so I can just wipe all that part out. But I won't. I won't. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. It, it's, you know, because again, it's hard. You know, we just, you know, I always say we see each other in glimpses. And, and I think that's true for the news. And 
uh, you know, and just the environment that we have here in the, you know, in the United States, just lately, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, you read things and you're, and then you question it is just accurate and all this kind of stuff. So that's why, again, having, having known you personally, and it's like, okay, so I know if Jonna says this or posts this, or, you know, it's like, okay, I, I know that I can believe that. And now what can I do about it? What can I do to help? You know, mm-hmm. and that's hopefully, again, that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because, you know, we have enough listenership. We've got enough traction now. I, I think, and I hope that by having you on and talking about these things that more people will, you know, join in, join up, sign on, you know, and, 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 you know, just try to help where we can and, and help advocate and help you know, bring some, some focus to these things. Cause I, I agree with you. It needs to be. And I see it, you know, and again, as I'm watching Emma grow up, she's 15 now. It's like, I, to your point, I can see the, you know, the peer pressure, like diverting her. And I don't mm-hmm. know if that's, I don't know if it's the peer pressure or it's her decision or it's her decision based on what the peer pressure, you know, and it's like, so I don't know if, happen. you know, I don't know how to feel all the time because it's like, you know, do I, do I, you know what I mean? It's like, and we'll talk about it all. She and I, we have a great relationship. So we talk about these things, but even for her, it's hard to know. I mean, you know, at that age, it's like, I mean, right. not for nothing, but I'm going through high school again, but this time as a girl and it's like, it sucks all over again, you know? So I'm like, it's just, it's like, wow. Yeah. So I have, you know, having daughters gives me a different perspective on all these things. So it gives me, you know, cause to take, just take a pause and think about, wow, you know, and then, right. you know, so anyways. Well, and I'm doing it with boys. And so it's the opposite for me. It's like, how do I make sure that they are the, the men that I think they should be, right? That they, they do see women as equal and do, and they've, they've been to more probably sweet events and conferences than lots of women have, right? I've taken them, but as they're getting older, it's the same thing. They're facing the same pressures, right? The same judgment from others where, you know, what, you know, in the past they would have been like, oh, mom, this is awesome that you're doing that stuff. I'll sometimes hear Ugh, another sweet thing, Another of this, like, so, you know, it is, it's coming back differently too. And I think a lot of it's just the age, right? Teenagers like to rebel, Yeah. but, um, you know, I'm certainly hoping that in, they're in there, once they grow up, they will remember, right. That they had a, a, a mom who was working and was successful and, you know, advocated for women and engineers and, you know, that anyone can be anything. And actually that does remind me of a really funny story, if you, if you don't mind. No, of course that I've, I've told a couple of times, but on that whole kind of gender, it's related to gender bias. So my, both of my kids, we go, the dentist we go to um, is, happens to be a practice with all women. And a couple, you know, several years ago when my younger one was, you know, maybe he was eight-ish, eight or nine, maybe seven. He actually asked, mom, can boys be dentists? Hmm. He had never seen a male dentist. All the, you know, all the um, hygienists, everyone, every single person at our office was, was female. Huh. And I'm like, you know, yeah, we can. Just like anyone, you know, yeah. women can be anything too. Men can be, you know. Yep. So right. it was interesting. That is, you know, it is because it is kind of funny you think about, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you know, so I'm hopeful anyways. Yeah. So John, in an effort to lighten it up a little bit, because this is a hefty topic, but uh, we always like to take a little break and uh, play a little game I like to call the Wicked Fun part, if you're up for it. Am I ready? I don't know. And hopefully it is Wicked Fun. That's the whole point of device. So I just have a few rapid fire questions for you. You could just answer off the cuff. Okay. Cool. All right. I'm ready. All right. Uh, We'll start with an easy one. What's your favorite song and why? anything from the 80s that's can, the right answer i can pretty much sing the words to almost any song from the 80s <laughs> i know it's pretty sad not at all it was easily well, the best decade well what scares what scares me is that i remember them yeah i can't remember what i did yesterday but i can remember a song from the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> i'll play uh 
thank goodness for YouTube because I play, I'll play eighties tunes. Um, uh, the outfield is like one of my favorite bands and the, my kids are like, this is not, you yeah. know, this is not good. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the best guitar riff in the history of the universe. So anyways, and I'm the right fact there that with we you. can get it anytime we want now. At the snap of a finger, we can get anything. That's right. Um, what inspires you? <sighs> what inspires me? Um, children, our future, right? Seeing, I mentioned before, seeing children play and be creative and have no worries in the world, right? That inspires me to keep going, to keep making things better, right? One of the, um, the things we talk about a lot in, in SWE and just in, in diversity talks in general um, for when it comes to engineering is we all wanna make the world a better place. And the reason why is, is for the children, is for our future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a, probably the most important thing, right? Ah, uh, let's see. What's ooh? This is this is one of my favorite ones. What's one thing nobody knows about you? Well, if I told you, then you'd know. True. <laughs> no, wait, you're gonna <laughs> pass that. You can pass. It's fine. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's it, it's not something that nobody knows about me, but not a lot of people know. So maybe that's close enough. Sure. Um. Although people around me do, but for your listeners, they wouldn't know. So I actually play women's ice hockey. I, I play I on a hockey team that. with a bunch of moms. That's you cool. Might have known that, but I think I remember. Now that you met, I so, yeah. I know so, I forgot, but now that you mentioned it, I think I remember you talking about it back in the day. Yeah. It's my other. It's my other family. That's cool. What position? Yeah, my sweet family, and I have my hockey family. Nice. What position do you play? Defense. Nice. Because I can skate backwards. <laughs> can you really? <laughs> wow. Have you ever ch checked anybody really hard up against the glass? No, unfortunately, oh. we're not allowed to. Oh, but, that's like the best part. Uh, well, so I actually did February. So I think I mentioned before we got on the air that I haven't been at work since February. Hmm. And part of that reason, not just the pandemic, I actually broke my foot in hockey. Oops. First the first broken bone in our team's history. Wow. Yeah. And I did a pretty good job too. It smashed it. Well, Hey, if you're going to go, go big, right? Yep, right into the boards. Yep. Oof. Um, what's your favorite word? Oh, my favorite word. Awesome. Because it can be used in so many ways. How about, um, what sound or noise do you love? Skates on ice. <laughs> I used to call the um, hockey games at Clarkson for our TV station. I see. I did not know that. Ah, see, ah. and uh, that you're right. That has that that sound. It's like yeah. it's very specific. And as soon as you hear it, you know exactly, you know what, exactly it what it is. Yeah. And I will add, it's even better when it's on our outdoor rink, in our backyard rink, which there right now is not, not frozen. But <laughs> I, right? Is it like yeah? It's like one of the warmest winters ever so far. Yeah. Or? So we have a pool. We have a, a temporary pool in our backyard. <laughs> um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I'd love to be a chocolatier, but I don't think I could. I don't have the willpower to not be like 500 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I love chocolate. Like There's nothing I wrong with that. I'd love to be making. I don't know. How about uh, what profession would you not like to do? Ooh, that's a tough one. I don't want to insult anybody. <laughs> um, probably, I don't know, something that's, I guess, repetitive all day. You know, I, I, I've gotten that before. When I ask that question, yeah. that's usually, it's interesting. I think if I Pareto there, that's probably the number one, yeah. either number one or two answer. Like, yeah, like data entry or, I mean, I'd probably figure out how to turn it into something more. I'd be like, ooh, let me look at the data. Let me make it this faster or whatever, but just pure data entry, yeah. Yeah, uh, that wouldn't be for me either. Yeah. 
All right, and then I'll ask you your favorite question uh, as the last one. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, other than a big welcome with open arms, uh, you know, I'd hope he'd say, you did a good job. Nice. I should say, hope she'd say. Ah, well played, Jana. Well played. So we're just about out of time. I want I don't want to keep you here the whole time. So is there anything, any words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our millions and millions of fans? I would. So I've got a really great piece of advice from a, a supervisor years ago um, that was always try to leave a legacy. So no matter what you're doing, what your role is, you can always leave some sort of legacy that um, leaves it either better for the people behind you or, you know, easier or has some concrete improvement over where you, when you came in so that people can remember that that's what you, that's what you contributed. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Right. Leave it better than the way you found it. Yep. Nice. Well, John, I can't say thank you enough. I mean, it was so good to finally like see you and to act, you know, talk to you live after all this time. If, um, if folks want to find you, what's the best way to get in touch? So LinkedIn, uh, John Gherkin on LinkedIn, but I, the rule I have is you need to tell me why you are connecting. So, right, so oh, you saw, you saw me on the podcast or I won't accept. All right. So no generic, just connect. So no generic. Nope. Got it. And we will link, connection. I'll link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. So if anybody's listening, but so you have to listen to the end. And so that's the rule is you have to mm-hmm. say, I heard you on the new England lean podcast. So exactly. All right. All right. And I'm on Twitter. I have a, you know, my Twitter feed is mostly about um, STEM topics, diversity, uh, diversity and inclusion in STEM. So that's where I tend to do most of my Twitter um, feeds. So happy to have you follow me on Twitter. Okay. All right. And, and I do not so much on Instagram, so it probably wouldn't be the best opportunity. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Big Instagram. Gotcha. All right. Fair enough. And then um, I'll find, or I can link out to the local sweet chapter and, and Girl Scouts of America, obviously. I'll put those links in there too. Yep. Okay. Awesome. All right, Jonna, I will let you go. Thank you so much for coming on and, and joining us today. This was fun. Thanks so much, Paul. All Good right. To- Hopefully it's not another 10 years before we get to chat. Better not be. I know. (laughs) All right. We'll talk to you later. Hey, everybody. It's Paul. Before I let you go, I just wanted to say thanks again for listening. Um, You've really made doing this podcast a very rewarding experience for me. Uh, I get a lot of messages from from listeners. and uh, You know, everyone has something nice to say, which I very much appreciate. Uh, of course, I'm always open to you know, uh, feedback on ways we can make it better. I mean, that's Kaizen, after all. And by no stretch do I claim to have got this all figured out. So if there's things that I could do better, please, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out and let me know. And likewise, if there's a somebody that you think would be a great guest, um, also let me know. Um, you know, there's a chance I don't know who those, who those folks are. So somebody that you can help put us in touch with, you know, somebody you want to learn more about, certainly let me know and I'll reach out to those folks. But um, I hope you find the podcast fun and entertaining, uh, uh, educational, and, and maybe even a little inspirational, I hope. Um, that's really what I'm, I'm going after with this whole thing. So thanks again. And uh, one small ask. Uh, if you don't mind, if you listen, you know, whatever your preferred platform is, if you could just, you know, subscribe, uh, give us five stars on Apple or, or whatever, again, whatever platform you listen to, it just, it, it helps, um, you know, the algorithms like it. So if you could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, everybody.